in a bygone era, you used to have to purchase games on a physical disc, and in an attempt to prevent you from copying that disc and giving it to your mates, the game came with a key that was printed on the inside of the box that you had to enter during installation. Presumably, the publishers thought that if you'd gone to all the effort of copying the disc, you would then not bother copying the key. But what if the game has long been abandoned by the publishers and the developers no longer exist? How do we play these games? I wanted to play Black and White, a classic god game from Lionhead Studios. Rips of the original CD are available on several abandonware sites, so I've found one and thrown it into a VM because you're never quite sure what you're going to get. Now let's install it. Okay, so the installer asks for a CD key, which obviously I don't have. So we're faced with several possibilities here. We could grep the internet for a key because I'm sure someone has posted one somewhere. We could try and patch out the check in the installer, or we could try and reverse out the key check algorithm and create our own key. Let's do the latter. It's a bit more challenging, but could be a lot of fun. Basically, when you enter a key, the program will pass it through some algorithm to check if it's correct. The program doesn't contain a list of all valid keys. Instead, it's checking that if what you entered conforms to some rules invented by the developer. So the game here is to find the validation algorithm and literally reverse engineer it so we can run it backwards and generate our own new key. We can see here that the installer actually starts a separate process for checking the key, which is handy for us as it should be reasonably self-contained and hopefully easier to reverse engineer. And in this ereg directory, we can see the key code program. First things first, let's get this open in Ghidra, an open source decompiler and disassembler. Let's search for the string in the window dialog we saw, and we can see it's loaded from this function. This function just calls another function five times, and each one takes the address of four null bytes and a string. Now the strings seem to be for different languages, so maybe this is some sort of localization. I've also found the same pattern is used for OK and cancel, so I'm guessing this is some sort of dialog builder. Before we dive headfirst into reverse engineering this, let's get it running under a debugger so that we can see what's happening as it's running. I'm using x64 debug. So if we enter an incorrect key, we get a message box informing us of the fact. So we're now at an important part of the program. Our key has been read, processed, and determined to be invalid. So let's see if we can walk back from the message box to whatever code decides to create it. In theory, I'm hoping there'll be an if statement somewhere along the lines of if input is invalid, then display message box. To create a message box in Windows, you use the message box A function. So let's set a breakpoint on that. Looking at the call stack, we can see we start off from a call to is dialog message A, so we're in some sort of message handler. I've had a little snoop around, but nothing really jumps out to me as a success fail point. Again, before we embark on reverse engineering all this code, let's see if we can figure out an easier way. The program must, at some point, read from these text boxes, otherwise how else would it verify it? In Win32 world, this would usually mean a call to get window text length A to get the number of characters, and then a call to get window text A to copy that many characters from the input box. So setting breakpoints on these, we can see that they are called and we can see our input string. We should probably use different values for each text box so they're easier to distinguish. Nice, we're onto something now. We can see each part of our input being read. Again, I've had a quick look through the call stack and there's just a lot of code, but we know that once our input has been copied into a buffer, some code somewhere must be reading from it in order to check it. Let's set a hardware breakpoint on the bytes for the string 1111. This will force the program to pause when it reads from it. So we've broken and I can see our values being passed into this function. This is called three times with different variations of our input and the associated string lengths. So our input is definitely being consumed. Walking up the stack, we do end up at an if statement, which checks the return value of this function. If it's zero, then it shows us the message box. So we finally arrived at the point I was trying to get to with an if else statement. And presumably this function is doing the validation of our input. In fact, if we use the debugger to force the return value of this function, then we don't get a message box and the program just exits. So this somewhat confirms our thinking. This code is duplicated because this version increments a variable by one each time. And if that variable is greater than three, it calls this version, which ends up just closing the window. Effectively, this limits you to three guesses at a valid code before the program exits. But I'm hoping we can get to the point where we just need one guess. So looking at the function which decides whether we pass or not, it calls a bunch of functions and then returns either 1 or 0. So the function is passed two values, OX53 and OX61. 
I have no idea what these are, but they're calculated elsewhere, so we might have to step back and figure that out at some point. The key part of this function is this if statement. If both ivar2 and ivar4 are the same and not zero, then it returns success. So ivar2 is calculated from this function, which is past our string and our two mystery values. It looks very keygeny, lots of loops and bit twiddling. The function which calculates the value for ivar4 just takes the value of the last text box, which is only four characters, and in our case is 4444. Now we can see in the debugger that both ivar2 and ivar4 are not zero, but they are not equal. Let's start off with the ivar4 function, because not only is the input simpler, the function itself is a lot simpler. We can ignore the else branches of these two if statements, as it's just checking if some global data is less than two. I don't know what this data represents, however every time I've run it, it's always been one, so hopefully this simplifies things a little bit. This first loop is a bit strange. It uses the first character of the input string as an index into a massive global array of values. If the value it looks up is zero, it stops looping, else it continues to the next character. And after the loop, it consumes the next character in the string. Then, if the character was the ASCII negative or positive sign, it consumes another character, effectively skipping over it. I think we can ignore this, as the input box would only let me put in numbers. The final loop is the interesting part. We start off by zeroing out the return variable, as this acts as a sort of accumulator. We then loop through the rest of the string until our character lookup returns zero. For every character, we subtract OX30 and add it back into the current accumulator value multiplied by 10. So this function takes the last part of the input and returns a number, which at the moment is different to whatever this mess returns for the first three parts of the input. There's a fun optimization here. Rather than multiplying the number by 10, it first multiplies it by 4 and adds 1, and then multiplies it by 2. It's pretty cool that Ghidra managed to decompile this back to a multiply by 10. Anyway, so there's two functions we care about. One which processes the first three parts of the input, and one which processes the last part. And we want these to both output the same number. But can we just brute force this? Let's copy this code from Ghidra and make it look like actual C. We're also copying this magical global array. Okay, so after a bit of fiddling, I've managed to get it to produce the same output for the value 4444 as the verification program does. I could do some fancy C++ ranges and permutations here, but let's just keep it simple and use a quadruply nested loop to try every single four character combination. So we're at the point now where we're going to input a known value into the first three text boxes and then use the debugger to find what that gets calculated to. We're then going to try every single possible input for the last box to see if we can find a matching value. Okay, that ran pretty much instantly and produced a value, so let's try it out. Yes! <laughs> I can't believe that worked. Now I probably shouldn't give out these last four digits, but hopefully it was an interesting excursion. Of course, I then went to actually play the game, but it was plagued with other issues, which will take more time to figure out, so it may be the subject of a future video. There does exist community patches for black and white, but I've not tried any of these out, so I can't speak to their effectiveness. I'm just enjoying trying to figure this out for myself. But the low-level fun doesn't end here. If you want to see how I hacked a horror game to remove the jump scares, then check out this next video.